As early as 1934, Ruth Benedict suggested that normality and abnormality are not universal. What is viewed as normal in one culture may be seen as quite abnormal to another. This makes sense because when you compare the culture of mainstream society to the culture of an indigenous community, you will find a huge difference in what is considered normal. If a person from the Iban community, who are known for their practice of collecting heads as trophies, were to live in our society, they would undoubtedly be considered insane. This alone opens a huge debate on whether we can differentiate between the sane and the insane. To make this even more interesting, imagine you were wrongfully admitted to a mental hospital and was told to have a severe mental illness. How do you convince the staff that you are actually sane? Do you think they'll believe you? This question is what exactly David Rosenhan, a professor from Stanford University, sought to find the answer to. He wanted to see whether or not professional hospital staff can determine a sane person in an insane place. In order to find the answer, he did the most insane thing a person could do, which is to admit himself to a mental hospital. The study is called the Rosenhan Experiment or the Thud Experiment. Not long after the publishing of the study, it had caused a huge impact in the field of psychiatric diagnosis that the experiment is argued to have accelerated the movement to reform mental institutions and to deinstitutionalize as many mental patients as possible. In 1973, the study was published by the journal Science, which is a peer-reviewed academic journal of the American Association for the Advancement of Science under the title On Being Sane in Insane Places. The purpose of the study was to determine the validity of labeling an individual's sanity and whether or not it is reliable. Conducted by psychologist David Rosenhan, the experiment was conducted in two parts. The first part of the experiment involved eight pseudo-patients which are also his associates which involves three women and five men, including Rosenhan himself. In order for the study to begin, all pseudo-patients were told to call an appointment with the mental institutions. Once they were there, they were told to fake auditory hallucinations in order to gain admission to 12 psychiatric hospitals in five states in the United States. All of them were told that they had been hearing the exact same voices saying, empty, hollow, or thud, in order to suggest that they have existential crisis. All of these pseudo-patients were admitted successfully and diagnosed with psychiatric disorders. The pseudo-patients included a psychology graduate student in his 20s, three psychologists, a pediatrician, a psychiatrist, a painter, and a housewife, where all of them had no history of mental illness whatsoever. For the pseudo-patients working in the mental health field, they were told to lie about their profession in order to avoid special treatment by the hospital staff. Apart from their profession and their pseudo-illness, all of the biographical info they gave had not been altered. All of the pseudo-patients were told to act normally as soon as they were admitted and to tell the staff that they no longer experienced any additional hallucinations. All of the pseudo-patients reported that, upon admission, there was a brief period of mild nervousness and anxiety since none of them really believed that they would be admitted so easily. Indeed, their shared fear was that they would be immediately exposed as frauds and would be greatly embarrassed. Moreover, many of them had never visited a psychiatric ward before, and even for those who had, had some genuine fears about what to expect and what might happen to them. The pseudo-patients, very much as a true psychiatric patient, entered a hospital with no knowledge of when they would be discharged. All of them were told that they would have to get out by their own devices, essentially by convincing the staff that they are sane. The psychological stresses associated with hospitalization were considerable, and all but one of the pseudo-patients desired to be discharged almost immediately after being admitted. After the study, Rosenhan appeared in a variety of shows, including the BBC. In the interview, he said, I told friends, I told my family, 
I can get out when I can get out. That's all. I'll be there for a couple of days and I'll get out. Nobody knew I'd be there for two months. The only way out was to point out that the psychiatrists are correct. They said I was insane. So I said, I am insane, but I am getting better, as an affirmation of their view of me. Their stays ranged from 7 to 52 days, and the average was 19 days. The pseudo-patients were only released until they agreed that they were mentally ill and they had to take antipsychotic medications, which they flushed down the toilet. All but one were discharged, with a diagnosis of schizophrenia in remission, which Rosenhan considered as evidence that mental illness is perceived as an irreversible condition, creating a lifelong stigma rather than a curable illness. Whilst the pseudo-patients were admitted, they were told to take notes of the behaviors of the staff and the other patients. None of the pseudo-patients were identified as imposters by the hospital staff, only by other patients correctly identifying them as imposters. A total of 35 of 118 patients expressed a suspicion that the pseudo-patients were actually sane. Some patients vigorously expressed their suspicion, saying, You're not crazy. You're a journalist or a professor. You're checking up on the hospital. What's concerning about this fact is that the hospital staff only interpreted much of the pseudo-patients' behavior in terms of mental illness where they referred to the note-taking behavior as writing behavior, disregarding the fact that they might be sane. On top of that, Rosenhan and the other pseudo-patients reported an overwhelming sense of dehumanization severe invasion of privacy, and boredom since there was nothing to do while being hospitalized. Their possessions were searched randomly, and they were sometimes observed while using the toilet. They reported that, though the staff seemed to be well-meaning, they generally objectified and dehumanized the patients, often discussing patients at length in their presence as though they were not there, and avoiding direct interaction with patients except as strictly necessary to perform official duties. Some attendants were prone to verbal and physical abuse of patients when other staff was not present. The false attribution of the pseudo-patient's sanity cannot be due to time constraints because, on average, the pseudo-patients were admitted to the hospital from a week to two months, averaging 19 days. It also cannot be due to the fact that the pseudo-patients were not behaving sanely because Patients in the hospital have expressed concerns that they were not insane. So what could be the reason? It could be due to the fact that physicians operate with a strong bias toward what statisticians call the type 2 error. This means it's better to make a false judgment for the sake of being cautious, which in this case is to suspect illness even among the healthy. Before I move on to the second part of the experiment, I'd like you to know that I have more videos like this where I talk about the dark history of psychology. Just be sure to click the link in the description box below. Rosenhan went to a well-known research and teaching hospital whose staff had heard of the results of the initial study but claimed that similar errors could not be made at their institution. Rosenhan arranged with them that during a three-month period, one or more pseudo-patients would attempt to gain admission and the staff would rate every incoming patient as to the likelihood that they were an imposter. The hospital staff was given a 10-point scale, with a 1 and 2 reflecting high confidence that the patient was a pseudo-patient. After the three months period went by, judgments were obtained on 193 patients where 41 of them were considered to be imposters and a further 42 were considered suspect. In reality, Rosenhan had not sent any pseudo-patients at all. As you can see, regular patients were misdiagnosed to be sane when they are actually insane, which means the first possible reason why patients were misdiagnosed, which is the type 2 error, is already disproven. This further begs the question, are psychotic diagnoses really reliable? If they are reliable, then what about the misdiagnosed patients in the second experiment? Were they actually sane but was wrongfully admitted to a mental hospital? How do we even distinguish between the sane and the insane? 
while listening to a lecture by R.D. Lang, who was associated with anti-psychiatry movement, Rosenhan conceived of the experiment as a way to test the reliability of psychiatric diagnosis. The study concluded that it is clear that we cannot distinguish the sane from the insane in psychiatric hospitals, and also illustrated the dangers of dehumanization and labeling in psychiatric institutions. The solution to this might be to use the mental health facilities to concentrate on specific problems and behaviors rather than labeling someone as insane, which is very vague. Psychiatric workers should be educated about the complexities of mental health and the best ways to treat their patients.